Everybody loves Bigfoot. We love Bigfoot in movies, commercials. It's become a important cultural icon. I'm 90% convinced that Bigfoot exists based on 45 years of research. I've been studying this for going on 14 years. I've been investigating for decades and I've been publishing my newsletter for almost a quarter of a century. I've read 106 Bigfoot books, probably got 500 to go. My first experience with it was seeing a photographic still from the Patterson Gimlin film. When she's walking across a sandbar and spreads her arms out and looks at the camera. It made me completely sold. The only really convincing film footage we have. That's the type of evidence that makes the case for Bigfoot compelling. I was working on a cabin in the woods and hammering at night and stuff and the geese were going crazy so I got my spotlight out and two of them jumped up from the farm pond, one with a goose in its hand. I'm up to about 145 incidents now. Me and uh, the little woman was out in the woods one day and uh, we found a footprint. There have been hundreds of casts made of footprint impressions that are very consistent. Things that look like Bigfoot actually did exist in the fossil record. Native American legends all over the continent to talk about a big, hairy, wild man. If the Indians saw it, uh, people in different countries or different, you know, all over the world seeing the same thing, and that's when I started to believe. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't, that, that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? What would I'd you say? say to read that? a book. Dang it, pick a book. I'm 100% convinced that they're out there. I've never seen one with my own eyes. The only reason we haven't found it is because it's adapted specific avoidance behaviors to avoid being found by us. We should continue on uh, in spite of the fact that we have no proof that Bigfoot is real. When you combine thousands of eyewitness accounts that are very consistent, Native American legends all over the continent to talk about a big, hairy, wild man, the Patterson-Gimlin film, which is really the only really convincing film footage we have, the footprint evidence, there have been hundreds of casts made of footprint impressions that are very consistent, and things that look like Bigfoot actually did exist in the fossil record. They were yeah. called hominins, and for Two million years in Africa, they were basically upright walking apes. They weren't as tall as Bigfoot. That's the only thing that doesn't really match up with the modern sightings of Bigfoot or Sasquatch. So if you consider all of that, it's actually, in my opinion at least, that's a pretty compelling body of evidence. The fact that I, I feel myself as a, a relatively intelligent person, well-educated, I kind of had to believe myself, believe my own gut that there was something honest and true about it. I'm 100% convinced that they're out there. I've been studying this for going on 14 years. I've read 106 Bigfoot books, probably got 500 to go. I've been investigating for decades and I've been publishing my newsletter for almost a quarter of a century. I'm Daniel Perez, uh, age 58, born and raised in Southern California, the Los Angeles area. Thank you all for coming out. It's an honor to be here at the uh, at this event. Uh, always happy to commune with my fellow Bigfoot enthusiasts around the country. Um, yeah, so my name's Ken Gerhard. I'm a cryptozoologist. Ken Gerhard is a widely recognized cryptozoologist, an author and a lecturer. In addition, he has written six books on the subject of unknown animals. His research has been featured on numerous TV shows, including Missing in Alaska, Monster Quest, Ancient Aliens, America on Earth, The Unexplained, and Legend Hunters. My occupation since 1985 as a professional work has been a union licensed electrician. I'm still in that occupation and I'm not retired, so we work in the field. We build uh, little buildings that you've probably never heard of, like Apple, Microsoft, Google. We do those. Sooner or later, you'll hear about those companies. 
All right, we're here with Doug, and we are, again, we're at uh, Bigfoot Days out here in West Branch. I'm up to about 145 incidents now. I, I keep getting more. Every once in a while, somebody call me and say, hey, this is what happened to me, and, and uh, uh, I like to get them to write it out. I think it's important to document sightings because then you have a history. Phil Shaw has lived in West Branch since 1972. His first interest in Bigfoot came in 2006 when he and his wife saw a probable Bigfoot in New Brunswick on a trip to the Maritime Provinces. I just want to ask you why you believe in Bigfoot and kind of what started your belief in Bigfoot. Okay. Well, as everybody probably watched some of the shows and all in the past, I grew up in the 70s so there was a lot of movies to watch. and. Uh, so I got out in the woods more and then eventually I just had where there's more experiences like noises and things you heard and like the howls you hear and then with the internet came out there's just a wealth of information. I heard sounds when I used to come up with my wife to my father-in-law's place and I used to hear callings because we sit at the fire at night and then one night uh, there was a big slap on, the, on my house and so that's my encounters with Bigfoot. Eric Salaji has had a lifelong curiosity of all things strange and unusual. Uh, he has had an early obsession in his life with UFOs, Bigfoot, and some uh, personal experiences that he's had with paranormal activity has fueled his passion for higher strangeness. My first experience with it was um, pretty much seen a, a photographic still from the Patterson Gimlin film right. in, a, in a library book. And um, I don't know, it just, it, nothing ever looked fake about it to me. And then flash forward to uh, uh, 1977, that would have put me at 12 years old, uh, in search of with Leonard Nimoy. Um, they actually showed the Patterson Gimlin film in its, you know, 36 second entirety or whatever it was, maybe 56 seconds. Um, and there was, you know, a lot of people look at that and say, that's a guy in a costume. And when I looked at it, even though it was at the time that there was no stabilization or anything like that. So what you saw was literally him jumping off the horse, running, trying to find some place to prop the camera up and then finally get a, a couple of seconds of steady camera footage. Um, there was just never anything about it that to me did not look organic. It, it just always felt true to me. I would oftentimes look at the newspaper and every once in a while there would be a, there was no internet back then, there would be a newspaper article about Bigfoot and I would take my scissors and cut it out and we shopped our shoes at J.C. Penney. Remember that store? And so I had a shoe box, so that was my first filing cabinet. I started putting those in a shoe box, my newspaper clippings, and so at this point, in terms of uh, my physical files, they are the largest in the world, period, flat out. There's nobody that has bigger physical files in the world than me. Ken, when did you start, when was your first belief in Bigfoot? When did that kind of pique your interest? And when did you first start to believe in Bigfoot? Well, first of all, I'd like to clarify that um, belief is not a thing with me personally, because I try to approach this from a scientific perspective. And in science, belief implies that you basically want something to be real. You know, it's more of an emotional attachment. So what I tell people is that I'm 90% convinced that Bigfoot exists based on 45 years of research all over the continent, working with all the leading investigators, interviewing hundreds of eyewitnesses. Uh, and I've never seen one with my own eyes, which is why I tell people I'm 90% convinced because that's a scientific way to look at it. There's always a, a margin of error. I was deer hunting up in uh, the UP. Um, I was working on a cabin in the woods and the geese were going crazy so I got my spotlight out and two of them jumped up from the farm pond, one with a goose in his hand. All right, we're here with Doug and we are at uh, Bigfoot Days out here in West Branch. And Doug, we just want to ask you, why you believe in Bigfoot and kind of what started your belief in Bigfoot? Well, as everybody probably watched some of the shows and all in the past, I grew up in the 70s, so there was a lot of movies to watch. And uh, 
So I got out in the woods more, and then eventually I just had where there's more experiences, like noises and things you heard, and like the howls you hear. And then with the internet came out, there's just a wealth of information. So once I watched a lot more internet stuff, you like, there's got to be something to this. And then I started going to conventions, and it just made me more of a believer. I haven't had an experience where I've seen one, but I've had where I've had experiences with sounds and things in the woods. So that's really what's kind of hooked me long have you believed in Bigfoot and kind of what started your your belief well just watching like you know finding Bigfoot um, just that really is was the biggest one you know um, 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 what's the other show um, it's not in search of but uh, Monster Quest we watched all those watched those and then uh, me and uh, the little woman was out in the woods one day and uh, we found a footprint and that's really what got us to this level here. We met Phil, and uh, you know, so that's that's why we're here now is because of that. And uh, it's pretty interesting. I'm not a very good speaker. So. Not a problem. Not a problem. I'm not great either. So, um, yeah. So tell us a little bit. Of, you said that you've had an encounter with Bigfoot. You've seen him. I've had quite a few encounters. T tell me a little bit about that. Um, I was working on a cabin in the woods and hammering at night and stuff. And across the road, I shine deer on the way in to go work at the cabin after I get off of work. And uh, they were out there chasing deer. I had four lined up along the wood line at one point. I didn't, you know, I was like, what is that? Didn't really know. And then one was balled up out there, I think crawling, sneaking up on the deer. And then, uh, you know, this is over a matter of years. And then I had, the geese were going crazy, so I got my spotlight out. And two of them jumped up from the farm pond, one with a goose in his hand. And uh, had a lot some lots of experience. I've seen them at 20 yards of the spotlight now, um, a female and a little one. And uh, then I saw a big one on a, on a creek crawling. I thought it was a bear. Got my binoculars out at 50 yards in the daytime. Stood up and looked at me, and it walked off. And then uh, the next day, somebody had a report. Bigfoot sighting. Same direction it was walking. That's incredible. And it's on the Bigfoot BFRO Bear Den Lake incident. So if somebody wants to look it up, they can. But I was, the day before I seen it, yeah. So kind of confirmed everything for me. That's awesome. And how long have you kind of been, you know, I mean, when was your first sighting? How long was it? Uh, probably about 12 years ago now. Now, did you believe before that or was it? Interested me. I, I, I never had anything definite. I've had some yeah. weird things. Yeah. But now I've gone... To the, I pretty much got it figured out, I think. So That's awesome. Well, thanks for telling your story. Already. Thank okay, you. Have a great nice to meet you, Grayson. Nice to meet you. All right, so we're here with Grayson. Grayson, uh, how long have you believed in Bigfoot, and why do you believe in Bigfoot? I don't know if I do yet. I have a really big interest in it. Okay. I'm pretty young. I haven't, I haven't had any sightings or anything like that on my own. But I'm really interested in the topic and just learning more about it and stuff like that. Awesome. So. so that's, okay, cool. So you're kind of like me. I don't really know about it. I've been interested. Um, I mean, what are your... What are kind of your thoughts? You know, what's your ratio? Would you say you, you're 50-50 on it? You're, you know. I'd say it's definitely a possibility. Like, I'd say, um, like, especially, like, in places like Alaska, where it's, like, deep, deep wilderness, I feel like if they did exist, that would be the best place to find it, where there's no humans. But I don't know. It's something that's really interested me. I feel like there's a good chance. There's a lot of evidence out there. Just never know. Awesome. Thanks for your time, man. Yeah. Enjoy the conference. All right, so we're here with Jeff, again, at, at Bigfoot Days. So, Jeff, just tell us briefly your story you know how long have you believed in Bigfoot um, kind of when you started and uh, what your experience has been since then I guess I've been believing since I was about maybe in my teenage years because you know you see it on TV and so you know you get excited that you know that it's out there and so my first experience as hearing the Bigfoot was I heard sounds when I used to come up with my wife to my father-in-law's place and I used to hear callings because we sit at the fire at night and then one night uh, there was a big slap on the on my house and so that's my encounters with Bigfoot so Clinton tell me a little bit about why you believe in Bigfoot you know how long you have and kind of what your experience has been well, I guess it all started in childhood, growing up hunting and fishing, and just hear the stories, uh, you know, growing up around hunting camp and stuff. So, basically, that's about it. 
And have you had any experience? Have you had sightings? Heard anything? Haven't had any sightings, but I'm pretty sure we've had some vocalizations, some type of sound. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Yep. Thank you. So, Chuck, just tell me a little bit about, you know, you, you believe in Bigfoot, obviously, correct? Yep. Okay. So how long have you believed in Bigfoot, and kind of what was your first reasoning or experience for believing in him? You know, I mean, I, I was, I'm was i always a big hunter, yeah. you know, and so uh, things in the woods didn't make sense to me sometimes, and so, of course, back then I didn't really know what, you know, you didn't really hear about Bigfoot too much. So then, you know, I had a couple experiences that, that I thought maybe was real, and I did some research on it, and I... You know, if the Indians saw it, uh, people in different countries or different, you know, all over the world seeing the same thing, and that's when I started to believe. And, you know, some of my experiences were, you know, me and my son, we were, went for like about a five, ten mile hike out in the woods hunting, deer hunting, and uh, we, we got to this really strange area and started seeing and we started smelling something. And I said to my son, I goes, man, something's going on here. And we stopped, no sooner we stopped, a deer jumped up right in front of me. And normally a deer would never let you get that close. For some reason that, that deer was staying there and we could smell tremendous pungent odor. And so that was kind of the first time. And then I was deer hunting up in uh, the UP uh, way back in some truck trails and me and my buddy, when we pulled around the bend, we, there was a big wide opening and there was something roaming across the field. And, you know, we couldn't see it. We didn't have our binoculars with us because we were getting into camp, you know, going back to camp. But it was huge. It was huge. And, um, and we watched it across the field. And it, it was either a moose or a Bigfoot, you know, so... Um, and then a couple years ago, me and the family, we, we took my Jeep way up out in the backwoods and we parked and my son wanted to uh, go swimming, but he had to go down this big creek. So he went down there and jumped in the water and I did a Bigfoot call. What does that sound like? Like a big scream. You wouldn't want me to do it right now. Yeah, oh yeah. So, so when I did that, <clears throat> something screamed back, you know. Now we were all back at him, and uh, I had a couple little my nephew, uh, grandsons, and granddaughter there. They got scared, so I turned the jeep around, and just for yucks, I did it again. And that thing was right at the bottom of the hill, screaming back, and. Two minutes earlier, ten minutes, you know, five minutes earlier, he was across the water. So he made some tracks fast, whoever it was. And the kids got, we got to go. And they started crying. So I jumped in a Jeep and drove out. So those are my experiences with him, you know. Um, but, I, you know, I, I'm a believer. And then you, now you don't believe in Bigfoot. Well, I believe in it, you know. I watched all the, the shows on it and stuff, you know. And I believe that if there's something out there, there's something out there, you know, because, like you said, people see it, and, but, uh, you know, I watch, you know, the shows that they have on TV and on about it, and, um, of course, I've never, you know, been like him, you know, but <clears throat> I still believe that there is something there, or people see it, you know, um, yeah, that's all I can really can say. Yeah, you, know. you said you dragged him into it. Well, yeah, and, and we we brought our camper, so we're camping uh, out up up down here, and yeah, we're not camped there, but we're gonna show up later this tonight. Walk around. Awesome. Thanks for your time, guys. I appreciate it. Yeah. The conference. Give me a. Let me know when. All right. Right all right. Let me get the, yeah. Let me so get the other picture. Up. So what what are we uh, what are we looking at? We're about to look at. Um. Just a questionable picture from a trail camera deer hunting a few years ago when my son's buddies got it on his camera. And not sure what it is. Can't, you know, there's no. But here's the picture before. And you see the stump. And then there's the picture after. Let's 
see. You kind of see a green, bluish green face in it. Yeah. Very interesting. So, no claims on what it is, but. It could be. Could be. There's a, ch there's a chance. And I've seen them in the area, so. And, and you've seen them, so. so yeah. They're knuckle crawling or yeah. whatever, so. It's pretty cool. All righty, thank you. Thank you. Hey, everybody, I'm George. Um, I live uh, about 18 miles, I guess, to the uh, almost directly east of here over in Prescott. And uh, got an 80-acre hunting camp, spent in our family about 35 years. And um, I decided about three years ago, you know, I was going to move up there and homestead it. Never had power, just outhouse and a big hunting shack kind of barn thing. And um, so the place has kind of been vacant you know, nine months out of the year, except for when uh, my dad and his buddies and our family and stuff are there bow hunting and whatnot. Um, but nobody's ever really lived there during the summer. So I've had a ton of experiences there. Uh, I guess I'll just, just to make it brief, um, I'll go with the first one and the last one. So first one that kind of like, you know, I, I wasn't really a full on Sasquatch believer or anything. I had you know, seen some curious things in the woods and listened to stories and whatnot. I wasn't a disbeliever in any way, uh, but it wasn't really on my radar. Uh, wasn't something I was really thinking about too often. Um, but one night when I initially moved uh, to our property, which was the summer of 2019, um, I would say it was like beginning of August or something, and I had been Kind of prepping myself knowing that the weather's going to change it's going to start getting cooler and i got to start thinking about am i wintering in the barn and i just had been huddling around uh this campfire that i just kind of made like my hangout area and we never really had fires there you know um it's a bow hunting camp my dad's a real purist like no one no one slams car doors or anything it's like you do the click and butt bump kind of thing and everybody's really you know, and everybody's from downstate, you know, Flatlanders, idiots, whatever you want to call them. Um, you know, so I had to kind of like, you know, pay my dues to not be called one of those for a little while. Uh, but I, um, yeah, I was sitting by the fire one evening and, and uh, it was just kind of one of those real starry nights. And, uh, and I hear this kind of like low, like a cow kind of sound, like a as about as good as I can get but it it was real real deep and textural like a cow and it was off maybe uh, a couple hundred yards to one side of me and I'm kind of like oh trying to think of like where the farms are close by and there's nobody that has cattle right where I'm at and I'm just outside the village of Prescott and we're kind of up on a hill so I can hear sounds um, through some of these kind of like terrain features uh, pretty good. And uh, you know, it was off in this big four or five hay fields that there's just never anything in. I kind of hear this whoa, and I'm like, huh, what was that? And then off, say that was at my like 10 o'clock, off about my one o'clock, maybe a hundred yards in, I hear another, a different toned one kind of whoa. And I was like, oh kind of racing through my mind like somebody's cows got out or you know it's maybe I had, had a couple beers I was sitting up it was maybe one or two in the morning um you know so I start running through my mind of like oh, what could that be and then the first one goes back again and I realized there was like a call and response kind of thing happening and moving towards me it was getting closer and then a third one chimed in much closer uh within like i would just estimate like 50 75 yards meters or so and i was like okay time to go in and you know we've got a big barn that i can button up and and i just i got freaked out but i still hadn't really put you know sasquatch in my mind yet i was i was just running through loose cows uh, like man do we have a feral hog problem what what could this be what could this be and uh so I, I went in the upstairs and we have a sliding door balcony kind of thing and I and I was tiptoeing and creeping all lights out and um, and I got my guns out and I laid out on the balcony and I got a pretty high powered assault rifle and a 30-30 and then my little pea shooter pistol 
and I'm laying there and I'm like looking out at our kind of pasture area and then there's the pine, these really thick pines and kind of those sounds are coming right at me moving and I uh and the thought popped into my head man could that be Bigfoot you know like if it is it's multiple and then the and then the next thought was I was gonna see it come out see something come out of the woods I just had this feeling someone's gonna walk right out and the thought popped into my head are you gonna shoot it would you shoot it would you shoot if you saw it this the mythical thing and I told myself no and uh, and I had put my phone up uh, and hit video record and I do have audio somewhere in iCloud of I took a long video it's just a blackness and it's got the last maybe two minutes of these sounds kind of moving um, so that was you know not the most exciting story but that's kind of what kicked off this uh, kind of flurry of activity over the next three years um anything from you know seeing kind of like impressions in the in the soft moss that look you know nothing like super definitive like man that looks like a footprint but you know a thousand things can when you're in the woods long enough so there was an incident where the couple who's now deceased they never saw anything on their property but there was a handprint that was left somewhere Wayne King came out to investigate and photograph and take measurements. And so that handprint was 11 inches. So there's 11, there's my hand right there. So you can kind of see the difference. 11 inches by seven inches wide. And then there was another handprint that was recorded in Fort Bragg, California from February of 1962. And we've had, for the people who get the Bigfoot Times newsletter, we've had many editions of almost back to back on the breaking news of a very old case from Fort Bragg. And that handprint was uh, 11 and a half inches long. So just a, a ginormous handprint and it doesn't look like just an expanded version of a person's handprint. It looks quite a bit different once you start to look at it. Uh, and so in this instance, in Dansville, a Wayne King went to investigate, and he says, I'm not going to be releasing the photos until they're copyrighted. I don't think that if they ever saw their, the photos ever saw the light of day in a newspaper article. But I'll be writing to him. I haven't been in touch with him for a million years and asking if, if he could release this information because this is the data that drives the idea that Bigfoot could possibly be a real species. And so I wanted to talk to you. Uh, so that's another case, and that happened in the late 1970s. But that's the type of information, that's the type of evidence that makes the case for Bigfoot compelling. Uh, one time they broke a tree off by me when I was by myself. When I walked out the trail and here's a broken tree. Um, one time I was camping up by Luzerne with three other guys and I think I got hit with a pine cone. Huh. And the other two guys were at the campfire and, and the other fellow was holding a flashlight for me. So uh, we were a long ways, 30, 40 yards from the wood line. And there was no people. We didn't see any pickups around or anybody else. And I don't, they wouldn't have known what we were doing anyhow, but anyhow, got hit with a pine cone. So it's, and then I recorded, I don't know if you guys listened to about seven minutes of what I call a mad ape in Kentucky. I guess I recorded it. This thing's going to be pissed off. Yeah. There's only people back here. That's not a person, that's... That's impressive. One guy wanted to say it was koi dog, but I don't think a, any kind of dog could have done what I, I was recording there. So yeah, I've had quite a few experiences, actually. I start hearing stuff, 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 yeah. crunching in the, the leaf litter on the, on the game trail. And it took maybe one or two steps and it stopped. And at this point, I mean, I had already been into Bigfoot for a long time, but Bigfoot was not in my mind at all because I was in 
a very small town yeah. right outside of uh, the property of a, a high school where my kids went to school. And it was just, and, and then it hit me and I was like, oh my God, this is a huge 12 point buck. He smells deer estrus on my, yeah. on my clothing and he's following me back to my seat. Yeah. And I was like, my heart just started pounding. Yeah. I'm like, this is the biggest deer anybody has ever seen. <laughs> I'm gonna be on <laughs> newspapers and magazines. And so I, I just, I mean, I started slowly walking again and I heard crunch, 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 crunch. Eventually get back to this deadfall where my gun was. And I had a, I had a bucket that I was sitting on and I never turned around. But now I'm thinking, how am I going to reach my, my shotgun with the least amount of movement? Right. Because I don't want to spook it. Right. So I was able to reach, grab the barrel of my shotgun. I pulled it up like this, flipped the safety off. In my head, I'm thinking, OK, so I'm going to take one step back with my left leg. I'm going to turn at the waist at the same time. It's going to be right there in front of me. I'm going to take the shot. It's going to be in the chest, but he's close enough. It'll go through. Yeah. And I went and I just barely turned and I heard this. <laughs> and I hear thump thump. And I, I turned and there's nothing. There's nothing. And I'm, I'm like looking around and I'm looking for a, I'm looking for a big white tail right. running away from me. And all I ever heard was boom, boom. I heard two. I didn't hear four, I didn't hear eight, I didn't hear 16, I didn't hear it taking off down the trail. Right. All I heard was boom, boom, after a really, really loud exhale. And, and I start looking for, I start looking for like twigs bouncing or a leaf, you know, Some floating yeah. back down to the, yeah. to the ground or something. And there was nothing, huh. absolutely nothing. And I'm like, what in the hell? So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm all jacked up. My heart's beating really quick. And again, I'm still not, I'm not thinking Bigfoot at all. And I'm like, oh my God, that was the biggest deer anybody would have ever seen. Yeah. And uh, so I stepped three steps back into the property that I didn't have permission. I had my shotgun and I'm looking into the woods. It could have gone far because it didn't, right. you didn't hear it running off into the distance. And I'm looking, I'm scanning, I'm scanning, I can't see anything. Finally, I, I walk back. I walk out of that woods into the, um, the grassy area that's maintained. And I started walking back down the, the row of trees to go back to my car, which was about 125, 135 yards. And I'm walking along the edge of the, the tree line. And as I'm walking, I'm hearing steps in the in the leaves in the tree line. And I had a pretty decent flashlight. I pulls off my head and shining. And it's not completely dark yet. I mean it's getting there, but and I'm I'm shining the light in there as I'm walking. And and I can hear it. Mm -hmm. I don't see a damn thing. There's there's no squirrel, there's no deer, there's no turkey because there's a lot of turkey roost in that area. It's and it followed me two thirds of the way to my car and then it stopped. But when I got very close to the back of the garage that the house yeah. that was on that property, that's when it, that's when it stopped. Yeah. So it didn't go, it didn't go beyond that into, and it wasn't until a couple of years afterwards where I started kind of putting it together. And it's like, that's why, you know, like with my show and, you know, really big shows like Sasquatch Chronicles or listening yeah. to Steve Isdall on, on YouTube when he e reads emails from people who have had experiences. It's, it's constant, um, constantly putting together what you've heard right. that makes sense. Yeah. And, and he always calls them puzzle pieces and, and literally, literally they are because it was kind of all at once that it dawned on me. It's like, okay, so I had, I had two footsteps behind me. It didn't sound like a horse trotting. It didn't, you know. Right. And if you listen to a deer walk and a horse walk, it's very similar, yeah. other than the, the clip clop yeah. from the, the hooves. Um, 
when you add two extra legs into it, it doesn't sound like a human walking. Right. And this sounded like I, you know, at first I honestly I thought it was the landowner, and and then I convinced myself that it was a deer. But it was always just crunch, 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 yeah. crunch, crunch, and it wasn't until a couple of years after that that I kind of put it all together, and I was like, Yeah, was wow. it? Was it? Yeah, wow. <laughs> you know, I mean, I don't know, but mm. when you start hearing, and and I guess you can. You know, I guess it's easy to draw a point from A to point B without it being true, right. but sometimes like the simplest answer is, is, the, is the right answer. Christine Van Aker. She went to the police with her account. It was first her and her three girlfriends literally out looking for this monster at night. And I guess they heard growls according to the YouTube video. And I guess those girls got dropped off and her mom got in the car and they were out. And one of these things, I guess a Bigfoot, had, had come up to the vehicle and apparently put its hand through the, through, the, through the windows which were down on the Impala car. And I'm assuming it gave her a black eye by just putting the palm right into her face because there's a photo of her that's in several Bigfoot books, early Bigfoot books of her with the black eye, and she's still living. And I'm just assuming that she received so much ridicule, ridicule over the years that she kind of probably stopped talking about it. It was pretty warm. I was sleeping in a hammock outside, and I, the way I remember it, I had the zipper on my uh, sleeping bag open because it was so warm. One of the guys in our crew, because there were, it wasn't just the family, it was there was other people that were from Texas with us. They came and kind of woke me up. They said, wake up, wake up, somebody's throwing rocks. So we're in a heavily wooded area in a campground. And it was hard for me to wake up because I was in a pretty sound sleep. But I did wake up. And he said, somebody's throwing rocks. And so I'm, I'm trying to process this information. And then I hear a thud on the dirt. And I said, it really woke me up because I could hear it, that someone, something was being thrown. Got out of my sleeping bag. And uh, the impression I got was that somebody was throwing rocks from a, a, a good distance. And the impression I got, having played baseball, is that those rocks were coming in underhanded mm -hmm. like this being lobbed like this because you could see it as the rock was landing within the five feet and it was interesting because it was dark out and these rocks were landing very close to us but not hitting us I had seen on in search of the long defunct uh, television series with Leonard Nimoy narrating that one of the people that was interviewed on the show uh, said something like ook ook because that was a native language of Bigfoot or whatever and I just remembered that I never really gave it any thought but I went I remember yelling out in the woods from the campground ook ook and then what came back was this long drawn out gur you could just think of it with a, a G a lower kiss G with a bunch of R's, just grrr. And then it went quiet, and that was it. Everything stopped, no more rocks. We never saw anything. We never saw who was throwing the rocks. The next day, we went up to look, but as that, as that stopped, I was still thinking that someone was playing a prank on us, so I surveyed our party, were we all accounted for? Were we, and everyone, some of the people were sleeping in the Chevy Suburban wagon with the, the, the seat folded down and they had sleeping there. And I said, yeah, there they are, they're, they're all there. And so to this day in that area, I don't know what was throwing the rocks that were the size of about a baseball, but someone was throwing rocks and uh, 
I'm open to the possibility that it may have been a Bigfoot because I don't know any other animal in the woods that could throw rocks. Right. And it didn't scare me. It was just, it was kind of surreal that something like this could be happening. And so that kind of, again, I wouldn't say it was Bigfoot, but my other option was like, what else could it have been? If it was a person joking, we would have found that person, I think, because we went up to the way I remember it. We, this is a long time ago, 42 years ago. We went up with flashlights on that hill, kind of looking around, nothing, nothing. So I just, I said, I don't know. It just remains a mystery to me. Um, we have our back 40 is uh, primarily swamp and it's just, it's the bedding area for deer. It's really prime bow hunting kind of area and it's rare to go down in that area. Um, so over those years, when there's not a lot of people around, I, I was having, you know, some audio experiences. Uh, one night I had uh, something go moo, like someone was imitating a cow over here. And then about five minutes later, I'm like, man, that was somebody just going moo. And then in the middle, kind of where those three sounds came from the first time, something went just like like Looney Tunes, like the, you know, Bugs Bunny or something. And I'm like, okay, I had problems with some locals just making fun of me because they saw a Bigfoot sticker on my water bottle, you know, and I spent a lot of time discerning between uh, my mental state, people pranking me, what I'm really hearing. And then the third one off off to the right flank, I'll call it, goes ow, 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 like imitating a coyote. And I was like, ha ha, that was the three sounds I got. And it was humorous. There was no kind of threat to it or anything. But uh, so fast forward to the last experience. Now this was, uh, I would say, late july early august of last year 2021 um right in the height of like mosquito season it's just hot and sticky and uh one of my old hippie friends had told me you know long ago in a conversation they were like man if you ever have a sasquatch experience leave them garlic cloves they'll love you forever like if you're in the swamp like leave them garlic cloves and it just stuck in my mind and i always I was always forgetting when I was at the store, and then one day I was just like, man, I don't know, what could it hurt? I was, you know, like, keep things away, I need some garlic in my life, whatever. So I bought these garlic cloves, and I had kind of just had them stinking up my pockets and stuff for a while, and uh, I had some trail cams I had to move in the out in the swamp, and uh, had a big predator problem with uh, coyotes, you know, and I'm very protective of, like, my my little birds and rabbits and stuff like that. I love the small game, you know, and I'm, and the, the predator stuff. I just kind of like, I had some predator hunters just kind of really pushing their way onto our property. And I was like, you know, I don't want to take care of my own predator problem. So I kind of reset some of my trail cams in areas that were low, uh, that I thought, you know, I might catch, see if there's coyote bobcat coming through that area. I was all setting these cameras and, uh, and I, put one in and I had this pocket full of garlic cloves and I just, I had accepted, um, you know, I've got proof enough from these last couple of years that this is a reality of my life and these beings are real, you know, and I just kind of like come to the conclusion. I really don't want to get a visual because I'm back pretty far back by myself. And I feel like our understanding of a comfortable distance is good enough for me. Um, and when I go back into the swamp alone uh, in the dark, I'm one of the, I don't know if anybody else will do it. I'm just one of the ones dumb enough. Um, you know, it, it's always feeling of like I'm being escorted or something. And um, so it was getting kind of, getting kind of dark. It was when the days are really long. So it was probably like eight, eight thirty, and I was getting kind of nervous and I, I set this last trail camera and the and the squirrels were going just berserk around me and I was like, well, so much for being stealthy, you know, it's like call it Squirrel War Three. They're just chattering and you know, I'm like, okay, guys, I'm here, you know, you got me. And I'm like, damn, squirrels and the squirrels had just been giving me hell all summer. 
red squirrels in my barn and and uh and I I came back onto our main trail and I stepped onto the trail and the squirrel chatter just stopped and everything got really kind of silent and I had like three or four cloves of garlic left and, and into the main body the thickest part of the swamp where no one really goes um I I kind of set a couple cloves of garlic out and just kind of made a statement like hey these are gifts uh thanks for letting me you know just sound like a crazy person in the woods talking to myself and saying things out loud because uh through all the research you know I've just kind of figuring like if things do mind speak that's nothing I really want to experience so we'll just talk out loud and um <laughs> I like I got enough voices in my head you know I don't need another one yeah I would be able to figure out which was which at that point you know they probably know that already but um so everything kind of goes silent and uh and I'm like you know it didn't really strike me as like that you know, I've listened to a lot of stories and that, that silence that people talk about where just the woods goes dead and the kind of the fear projection. I didn't, I didn't really have that, but I was like, oh, man, cool. The squirrels stopped chattering. You know, it was just striking that, that they weren't chattering anymore. And I found myself in this area that I had been a bunch of times, but it just it looked different. It was getting twilight, kind of this humid fog over the, the swamp and and uh just mosquitoes everywhere and I, i'm like okay i gotta leave these garlic pieces and then i hear this this thump behind me i took a couple steps and i turned back over my shoulder and there was like cleanly ripped in half a uh, red squirrel and just the back legs its tail and its abdomen like guts hanging out and i'm like all right did a bird you know i'm looking up like did an eagle drop it i was just going through my mind of all these things and and it i was like well man something fast enough to snatch a red squirrel fresh and it felt like they just went hey squirrels bothering you look at this and i was like possibly yeah yeah it was kind of like in a you know just this like feeling of I, I'm always feeling like I'm being watched out there I'm getting kind of goosebumps talking about it and um you know and it, it takes a lot to rattle me um I'm a you know I've been uh, in a couple crappy places in the world rough deployments uh you know I'm combat wounded guy and and I've had my brain rattled a few times so you know I I kind of like don't necessarily trust myself sometimes when I'm out there like you know there's times where you can think, you know, a, a black squirrel's a huge buck or, you know, blue jays, something, you know, so I'm always kind of skeptical of things. Uh, so, and I, and it was just getting dark and I was like, I, I kind of came to this conclusion and through hearing stories, I like the nighttime's not mine anymore. I don't just aimlessly walk around like I used to um, with one eye shot and just, you know, being out there, but I was in the swamp longer and I felt comfortable and I was like I got this last little bit of light and I've got to get up to my barn and it's a it's a path that comes out and then I hit a bean field take a left walk the bean field up go up the hill and then I'm back at my barn and it's safe zone um and I so I turn my red headlamp on you know and it shows I shine really good if I see a deer or anything and when I get up to the bean field man it's really getting hazy I get up to the bean field just about maybe 20 yards in front of me and it looked to be about 10 foot tall just one red large eye shine and I just got wide-eyed and I hit my white light and there was nothing there and I turned that light back off and I got freaked out I was like all right I'm out of here you know I just started I was like, thanks everybody for playing along and I'm um, just heading on home, heading home. Thanks for letting me give you garlic or whatever, check my cameras and talking the whole way up. And I get um, I get up to the barn, it's like huge sense of relief. I'm back in home base and I, and it, I was like, man, I just couldn't stop thinking about that squirrel and what type of athleticism it would take to grab a red squirrel, you know, they're just, I mean, like a red squirrel, if it came running at a full-grown human, you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, it's they're just squir squirrely, for lack of a better word. Uh, and 
and I, I was, and I said it out loud. I was like, "Hey, that squirrel!" As the relief came in, I was like, "Now oh, that was impressive." And right from the valley, right behind my barn, uh, there was a chirp. Like a, my dad does a squirrel chirp. I can't do it, but it's like a whistle chirp. Sounds just like a, when a squirrel does one little blast, and it sounded like it was on a PA system. Just poof, right after, I was like, "That was impressive." And I was like, "All right, good night. We're going inside." And uh, I, you know, I've, I've slept with one eye open for a long time, but um, I guess to wrap it up, you know, what I've kind of taken from these experiences that I've been having there is like, I get a strange sense of comfort and I feel like I have a safe place that these beings might travel through. And I would really like to keep it that because, you know, if, I've been out there by myself for a long time and if anything wanted to hurt me it had a million chances and obviously you know I've never laid eyes on anything I've had some things that I just made the conscious decision not to look at out of the corner of my eye uh, but you know they could have me at any time and I feel like we have a little bit of a an understanding and um, you know people scare me uh, but uh, yeah, thanks. To I have read that some believe that uh, Bigfoot or Sasquatch have paranormal or uh, superpowers. You're, now you're, you're doing, doing it to me. Well, I, I have to ask you that because <laughs> they're into paranormal things right. clearly. What do you think about that? Uh, okay, so you're talking about the woo. That's what. Bigfooters and people who are enthusiasts and interested in the subject, that's known as the woo. Okay. And the woo encompasses anything that is not really physical evidence, like footprints in the ground, you know, castings. Right. Um, mind speak. Um, I don't know who said it, but paranormal is only paranormal because we don't understand it yet huh. you know it's yeah. it's not necessarily it's not necessarily something that is supernatural or like from beyond yeah we just don't understand it. We're not now you know the US military invested millions of dollars into a project when they started using people to remote view yeah and they spent millions of dollars on this project because it's it's real and it works. So we know that psychic abilities exist. So can Bigfoot's mind speak? I don't think it's out of the realm of possibility. Can they can they affect how you feel when you're in their presence? Infrasound is known in the natural world. Tigers create it with a very low frequency in their growl, and it's designed to scare you. Yeah. You, it makes you freeze. Yeah. You, that, yeah. That's part of their hunting, you know, yeah. they, they get the, the, the prey to not move and it yeah. becomes an easier target. Um, not necessarily saying that Sasquatch or Bigfoot use that to, because we're prey, but is more of a an intimidation I think as more of a an influence to get out of the area because that's where they are that's that's what they call home right possibly that's a uh, a birthing area you know they have young ones there I mean who knows but yeah I think there is something to the to the woo and hmm. you know like you get the academics like Jeff Meldrum and who's extremely well respected and has done a phenomenal job with um, you know the the foot casts and stuff like that and even Cliff Barackman from Finding Bigfoot they they rest on this wall of science they lean against it pretty heavily because it is it's easy to it's easy to back yourself up when you have proven science standing behind you mm -hmm with the woo aspects of it 
we can't really measure that. Mm-hmm. We, you know, telepathy, mental telepathy, to the telepathy doesn't leave a footprint right. in the in the right. ground. Something physical does. Um, so how do you measure that? And I don't think you can. So I think that's why they stay away from discussing that kind of stuff. And you can't even really. I've had personal conversations with both, and you really can't even like get them off the record to talk about it because they don't have a basis to to stand behind it. Um, but I, you know, it, it's always been one of the more interesting aspects of of Bigfootery to me. Yeah, and and I think it is. I think I think they have attributes. You know, I, I guess I've said this before in some of my shows. Back when, back when we were living out on the plains, mm-hmm. and there was a fire ring, and we were sleeping around the fire in the open sky above us, and we were sleeping with one eye open because we didn't know what kind of predator right. was going to come into the camp, or somebody had to stay up all night yeah. to make sure that the other members of the tribe didn't get taken by a wild animal or some yeah. kind of predator. Um, that was a long time ago. We've had walls and ceilings and roofs and lockable doors and windows around us for a long time. Mm-hmm. And I think, I think we've lost some of our senses. Mm. You know, not to say we had six, seven, eight, nine senses. I'm just saying the, the, uh, we them. the, the acuteness of our senses have been dulled because we don't need them anymore. Yeah. You know, and I don't know if, if these things do exist, and I, and I believe they do. Uh, if they're living out in the wild and they're having to, you know, I mean, right. there's no evidence that these things are um, creating any kind of household structures. You know, there's there's nesting areas, there's other places that kind of give the impression of it might be some kind of a lodge, uh, but they're not they're not structured housing. Right. You know, and there's no real evidence to show that these things are known to use. Um, anything more than maybe rudimentary tools. You know, we never hear about fires in the middle of the, the woods where there's nobody at, you know. We don't know that they're using fire, so I imagine that they have to be relying on their senses way more than what we do. Right. And they, quite honestly, if, you know, if you're walking into a, a wooded area and they're there, they probably know way in advance right. that, that you're walking in. They probably hear their car door slam, you know, yeah. from... Uh, a long, long way, and I've read a couple of papers that are talking about the the light sensitivity, how how little bit of light over like a mile and a half away that they can recognize. Now I don't know how, exactly how they know that, but um, I imagine it's all theories. But it's interesting stuff. Yeah, no doubt about it. But. Within the Bigfoot community, I'm what is known as an aper, okay. which basically means that I am, if Bigfoot exists, I think it's a hominin, which is a great ape. Okay. And that has, it has, basically it has a similar locomotor system to us, that is it walks upright, primarily on its hind legs, which mm-hmm. makes it look very human. But as far as the physical characteristics that are described, covered in hair, ape-like features, receding forehead, sagittal crest, powerfully built, it's an ape. And that's that's my opinion. I think it's easy to look at something that stands up on two legs, walks on two feet, and even though they might hunch over, or their long arms might be longer, and their their head is lower set on the neck, you still want to assign human attributes to it because it looks like it walks like us. Right. Um, if you watch a bear, a bear can walk upright, yeah. but a bear doesn't have really long arms, and it kind of waddles more than it has strides and these things are said to have a very smooth stride to them almost to the point where they almost look like they're on roller skates or on skis because you don't see any kind of head bob and it, it's just a very unnerving way that they move so um, I think I think they're more closely related to us I don't think they're a um, I don't think they're a close relative but I think they're more us than than ape our best guess for the moment is it's a primate like us because we are primates and I would just leave it at that because if you were to go further down the road or farther down the road it's just a guessing game if you were to say it's an ape 
part of the ape group, part, part of the human species, that's your guessing. And I would say just, just until that time comes, the best answer is to say, I don't know, or more than likely, it's just a primate that's in the group that we're in. And that should be enough. Uh, in terms of my book and my presentations, it's kind of respectfully pushed back against a lot of the misinformation that's out there. And unfortunately, one of the, uh, one of the failings of this great world we live in with this social media and instant communication is there's just a ton of bad information out there about Bigfoot on different podcasts and things, and people just make things up. Most people, when you have that conversation at the restaurant, the sidewalk, or at your neighbor's place, you go, I believe in Bigfoot, I don't believe in Bigfoot. You know, that's, you might be talking to your neighbor and this is, I've seen one, I believe in it, and your neighbor might say, you know what, I've lived here all my life too, I don't believe it. What do you say, Phil, to the naysayers or those that aren't, that, that, that would say you're crazy for believing in Bigfoot? What would I you say? I say read a book, dang it, pick a book. <laughs> Almost any Bigfoot book. Uh, you know, there's some are better. Dr. Meldrum's book, Sasquatch, or uh, Legend Meets Science, probably one of the better ones. But, you know, for people to be so positive about something and not make any effort to study it, and you know, I really don't care if they believe, but don't be so darn positive unless you're willing to read a book about it and study it. Only 18% of the general population thinks Bigfoot might exist. I'm confident they're out there, but it's just like, I would like to see one, I haven't, but you know, seeing one would be, again, it would reinforce your idea that you already have. Always carry a good camera, and if you think they're in the area, take a look. I actually, a lot of people have cell phones today, prefer a camera that you can document. I figured out I got 18 power zoom on that thing. I've never had a Bigfoot sighting, so I tell people I'm not 100% convinced it exists, I'm 90% convinced. After Rene de Hinden died in 2001, there was a lot more study on the film by Bill Munns and some other people and some other studies that actually freelancers that have posted stuff up on YouTube that are making these points about the subject in the film and it just all the information I'm seeing it just it just it made me completely sold on the idea that the PG film is 100% real and if the PG film is real then Bigfoot is out there part of it is the you know the number of stories out there of things that correspond with all the books I've read if they're biblical actually Esau and the Edomites, Genesis 25, uh, the twin brothers, the all hairy red man like uh, Esau was, if he in fact mixed with the giants, the Nephilim, you've got a, you've got a, a, a being there, you know, it's just, it's a biblical reference, no proof, but uh, just the same, I think it's a great possible heritage. There's another shot of John Green, uh, September of 2003 in Willow Creek, California. So he gave a very good presentation there talking about his life work. And he basically summarized that we should continue on uh, in spite of the fact that we have no proof that Bigfoot is real, but to continue on. Everybody loves Bigfoot. It's a monster, and maybe it's an unknown animal. Kind of combines everything that I love. In my opinion, Bigfoot or Sasquatch can get to be about nine feet tall. It has a body that is mostly covered in hair, except for the palms of the hands, the soles of the feet, and usually eyewitnesses say there's not much hair up here, up on the top of the nose, the bridge of the nose, and under the eyes. Keep searching, baby. Stop, and you know what? Yeah, wake up, I'm alive, so I'm going. Find my place to thrive and survive. They can think I'm alive, you know I'm golden. In the grass, so tall, I gotta hide. Passing Patty in the parking lot, she wanna ride. Girls, my only skin I can see is around her eyes. 
But like her, all legends must die So go ahead, keep snapping your cam Keep playing that tune, give me all that you can Being rude is not a part of my plan Well I guess unless I'm hungrier then I gotta show you fool So I am, so if you say that you see me then you're one of the few If you still don't believe I got something for you You can step into my home but it might get ugly Stay away from my door and I'll remain the unseen Unseen, I'm the thing of a dream I'm creeping around the woods in the evergreen So you try to snap a pic for your magazine Don't get too close, I'll make your children scream I'm big, I'm scary, I'm truly a freak I'm a different kind of beast with a different technique I'm quiet, invisible, so unique If you saw me up close, you'd simply shriek Leave me alone and let me be Cause I don't wanna see you, why do you wanna see me? From Cali to Florida to Tennessee I'm the king of the woods and I remain unseen